Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Uh, let's just wait for a few minutes and uh, we'll wait for everybody to join in and begin the webinar. Also, let me know in the comment section, in the Q&A section, if you're able to hear me and if my uh, video is clear. Oh, I believe we can start now. Uh, so yes, thank you so much everybody for joining. My name is Molly and I'm your host for today. And I've been working with Signet One for the past three years in the marketing department. I appreciate your time and presence over here. Over the course of this webinar, we will deep dive into the recommendations of the GST Council in its 53rd meeting, providing procedural reliefs, paving the way for reduction in litigations and clarifications that we are waiting for. I'll also introduce the speakers for today and uh, I thank all of you for being here and uh, letting us know your inputs on the GST Council meeting. First of all, we have Mr. Madhukar. He is the founder and partner of HNA and Co LLP with 15 branches across India, specializing in indirect taxes and FTP. He is the director of Hiregangi Advisory Services Private Limited and pioneer of the indirect tax reviews audits now GST review audits. Uh, he has jointly authored over 36 books on indirect taxation, including GST since 1997. Uh, along with him, we have Mr. Ashish. He is also a CA with over 15 years of experience serving large uh, Indian and multinational conglomerates, providing consultation, audit and representation services in indirect taxation. He currently heads the North India operations from the NCR branch of HNA and Co. He specializes in domestic, uh, in domestic indirect taxation with hands-on experience in Middle East VAT. And lastly, from HNA, we have uh, Mr. Vikram. Uh, he is a CA with uh, 15 years of experience, currently serving uh, as a senior partner at HNA, overseeing the Tamil Nadu state. He previously worked for almost five years at the Big Fours. 
He has extensive experience, expertise in indirect taxation and audit, working across various sectors, including IT, automobile, manufacturing, insurance, and many more. From uh, Signet One, we have the founder and the MD, uh, Mr. Neeraj Hathi Singh. He has over three years, uh, three decades of experience spread over diverse industries. He has charted Signet's growth towards digital engineering solutions, providing especially in field of tax and finance. His expertise is geared towards helping companies architect completely automated and futuristic tax tech solutions. Um, so yes, we'll begin now. And uh, if you have any questions for us, please uh, use the Q&A section. And yes, we'll start the session. Uh, sir. sir, you are on mute, Madhukar sir, you need to unmute yourself. Good afternoon to all the participants who have joined uh, in good numbers. And we hope that uh, we'll go away with a number of value adds by the end. I will broadly give a helicopter view of what has happened and after that the specifics would be taken by Ashish and Vikram. If I look at uh, bird's eye view or helicopter view of what is happening in the uh, GST, if we look at what were the original objectives of GST, GST came after a turbulent period and uh, just before it was it was implemented there were a number of uh, election promises made on what it is going to be <clears throat> is the uh, yeah the first one was that uh, we need to bring in more and more industry services into the GST net so that it gets spread across. And uh, maybe even the rates could be bought down over a period of time. The exemptions which were there, and there were many, believe me, 500 or so, were to be reduced. And that has been done to some extent. Broad basing has certainly happened thanks to also the transparency which has come in because of Aadhaar, because of uh, you know, the GPA, where even small businesses have been using information technologies to get paid. The second one was avoiding cascading of duties, which is a, which is a big problem because it distorts the price of goods. Presently, we have the uh, petrol, diesel, gas, stamp duty not subsumed into GST. And that is certainly distorting uh, the cost of goods because it constitutes around 6 to 7 lakh crores of taxes which are not subsumed. That means it doesn't get set off even though you use it for your business. In the past, under uh, VAT or in under central excise service tax, there were a number of artificial restrictions which were there. The promise was that these would be removed, but somehow most of them have continued. Of course, the advantage in GST was the VAT not being uh, used for central excise or service tax and vice versa was removed. To that extent, cascading was reduced. However, even now we have some restrictions and today also some attempt has been made by government to see whether some of some portion of the unfair restrictions are going to be removed. Making the law simple 
was one of the main objectives but unfortunately what has happened is that uh, the law is still fairly complicated but instead of 11 laws there is only one law and in this gst council meeting also we see that there is certainly a direction to see that some of these difficulties faced by trade are met but i don't see the government biting the bullet and making the law simple the compliance cost for the taxpayer you know though there are not multiple compliances they are quite a lot and this has been made more difficult because of massive number of changes and the draft has undergone lot of changes we also see lacks of notices this is a cause of real concern while looking at all these and looking at uh, collection as the main objective excessive powers have been given to the authorities that is the executive making the law transparent and using information technology i think government has done very well and i understand that they are a bit ahead of the industry itself which is really laudable collection costs cost reduction for the government has has been fantastic you would say you have also observed record collections month after month year after year the other side of it when gst was introduced there was a lot of talk about knowledge and uh, updating the knowledge of the law because this was a new law the vat officers has no idea about service services and uh, possibly the central central uh, officers were not very good at trading so knowledge and skill training for officers was supposed to have been taken up in the first two years and uh, that unfortunately has not come to great levels there is some sort of a training given in the department but not great even the people who are in um, sensitive places like the commissioner appeals the advance ruling authorities they have not had to pass any exam they have not had to understand the past law they have not had any need to understand uh, the precedents which are there gst council itself in the starting it took off very well and uh, we were all very happy that uh, regular meetings were taking place to resolve the problems of uh, the businesses but i have seen that in the last uh, maybe a year or two it is more and more decisions are only on collecting more and focused on evasion which is hardly 5 10% now there was also a talk of rewarding the honest businesses but uh, i think till now it is only lip service nothing has been done here reduction in litigation which is one of the main uh, topics today by use of it was something which should have taken place and has taken place from the point that we don't have 22 uh, locations or all the states raising their own demands you have only a one one tax broken up between center and the the particular state and there also since the law is one for all the states i think there is going to be some amount of reduction in litigation coming up even more however as of now since there is a uh, there is a lack of knowledge with the officers the notices only get issued when the time bar comes when they have no other choice but to issue a notice so they try to close assessment they don't give time they ask for information which they cannot analyze in the short period of time and also some of the uh, large number of notices multiple notices like 10000 20000 notices based on say the difference between the income tax return and the gst return without application of mind using the it also is a cause of concern one more issue which is very important is that uh, while everywhere the tax payer has been made accountable and sometimes quite severely so the officers are not accountable at all they have a protection and they can do what they want this is causing a lot of problem on the ground specific observations for of on this 24th june i mean uh, june 24 meeting 
is that this is my uh, view the spirit of genuine effort to resolve major issues seems to be missing while many things have been touched and they are good minor movement of reforms i see and i also see that the uh, the way the gst council has given its minutes uh, it is likely that again revenue will rule the roost and uh, wherever benefits are there they will whittle down wherever there is a chance of some evasion those will be closed and even the tax compliant will get uh, impacted through the notifications and then the circulars unless of course they limit it major issues of complicated law have been uh, side stepped you would know that uh, this was a kichdi law it had uh, central excise it had the customs it had vat principle cst principle service tax principles and also some of the foreign law principles presently it looks like a banded approach to me and uh, the major issues which are basic or foundational seem to be side stepped we have seen many issues in the many of the uh, legal disputes which could have been addressed in the gst council they have said that it will be in status quo so i see dozens of them and there are also some which are deferred classification is a very very important area and only experts can do it i see that uh, in spite of not being able to stabilize all the issues in classification now they have given it to a group of ministers how can this result in any uh, plus i cannot even imagine many of the beneficial me measures are not very clear they are indicating something but not providing it for it clearly and this would be bought out by our partners ashish and vikram thank you very much i hope you enjoy this particular uh, conference over to you ashish or vikram So, uh, sir, we'll take uh, Neeraj sir's session first, wherein he yeah yeah sorry sorry, sorry. On... yeah yeah Neeraj uh, Neeraj ji, I would also like to listen. Please go yes. ahead. I'll just share my screen. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I just want to uh, kind of uh, touch base on a small topic, or actually a very large topic, is that a new form or a new return is going to be introduced, which is GSTR one. And is it going to really make things simple for us? That is something I'll try and debate. Today we don't have answers. I will just kind of raise more questions. but there are many questions for all of us to deliberate upon now what gstr1 allows that after you have filed your uh, return gstr1 uh, kind of uh, you have filed your gstr1 and you have some invoices which are missed out or you want to amend some invoices gstr1 a will allow you to do that so this is a interesting concept for somebody who has made a mistake in filing his gstr1 and before you file your 3b you are allowed to correct it that is having said that any record that you have missed out you can add into it as what as my team that they have put it across it is very interesting in nature but when i was kind of debating with them my question to them was that yes the liabilities in 3b definitely will kind of be impacted but what will happen to gst or 2b will gst at 2b 2a on a daily basis will get amended or corrected on to it what will happen to gst at 4a and 6a and even in gst at 9 it will have a impact so without a kind of a robust technology solution to be able to handle all this complications in excel files 
how are you really going to handle this complication so that was a kind of a major question for us the caveat says that that the amendments will be allowed only once and records amended through gstr 1a cannot be amended in next month so this is what the caveat says but multiple clarifications are required on to it and we will have to actually test out the system how it works before we provide you many more clarification around it the impact of gstr a on a supplier is first mismatch in liabilities as per gstr 1 and 3b will be minimized actually a good point to be done so that i have clarity as a supplier and i don't have that much amount of confusion users will now have to track liabilities reported amended in gstr 1a and reconcile with cb some extra work for us good enough next is recipients may follow up filing invoices uh into a and that what happens to the fee that has been submitted on 14 if you file an amended one on 15 or 16 what will happen to that date any addition in liability around due dates in fact for provision how to also make provisions for now this continuous cyclic nature will keep on for the recipient Honestly speaking, it's a nightmare because you are not sure the amount of tax credit that you are going to take into the whole system. So you have based your input tax credit on the GST that will be that has been available onto the 14, and maybe two percent, one percent, or five percent of the invoices get amended subsequent to it. How you are going to tackle it? You have to kind of reconcile and say take the base invoices from to be. from that invoices if any one of them have been amended continuously monitor the two way and till the last moment you cannot be sure about your liability so this is going to be more complex and more complicated for the recipient in how they kind of file that so up till now these changes were possible but we were doing subsequent month but today this will happen during the month so this is going to be a little bit more complicated the reliance on compliant vendors and reliance on verification of the data before you take invoices into your system are going to be the most critical parts around this if we talk about the way ahead i only have questions for it that is this tracked over disabling editing of auto populated gst r1 for taxpayers generating invoices so this is one step because editing will be uh, stop or editing will continue We are not sure about it. These invoices of past month generated post filing of GSTR one be auto populated in GSTR one, making an addition to the liabilities in GSTR three. Unless and until we test it into the system and debate it with GSTR, we will also not be sure about it. Documents one amended through GSTR one cannot be amended subsequently. But will this condition also apply to export invoices which are currently can be amended multiple times? we are not sure okay how the system behaves we need to understand check and then only will be able to when can the itc of the invoices reported in gstr one be claimed whether they will be reflected in to be of the same month but if the amendment is done post 14 how is it going to reply reflect in the same month so can we take the credit of it or it will go into the subsequent month in spite of the Uh, supplier having filed the GSTR one and yeah amended into one day and filed the tax, we will be able to take credit only into the subsequent one. We are not sure about it, and we need to seek the credit. Then how to deal with the amended invoices post generation of GSTR to be? I just talked about it, and again the reliance on to be and even reliance on to be will be much more for the invoices which are already populated in to be. Will purchase reconciliation become all the more challenging? Hundred percent, it is going to be extremely complicated. And if we are going to try and do this in Excel file, it's never going to be workable. We will need robust systems which will provide all this data on a flat to do this. And is GST here to be becoming just another GST here to be? It's question for all of us to debate. But the surety and the sanity of GST here to be. Will be questioned because we will be 
allowing amendment of invoices. So this is all from my side. If you have any questions, with whatever limited knowledge we have, we can try and kind of uh, share uh, that information in here. But we have raised multiple questions to GSTA and we'll wait for uh, the supply. So that is all from my side. Over to you, Ashish. And if there are any questions in between, we will take a pause. Any questions from Madhukar sir or me, if there are any questions, we can take a pause and answer that question or we can start with Ashish's presentation. Molly, are you seeing any questions into the chat yes. window? Yeah. Yes, sir. There is a question. Uh, I'll just read it out for all of you. We have yeah. paid penalty on GST ITC disallowance as per the assessment order for the FY 27-2018 and 18-19. Now waiver for was announced. What should we do? Uh, Molly? Yeah. Uh, I suggest if we finish the technical deliberation, post yeah. which we can take yeah. a uh, this question. So only if there are questions regarding one a or what Madhukar said, we should address it now. Otherwise, we should wait for the technical deliberation because a lot of these questions will be answer, answered in what Ashish and Vikram are going to talk. Okay, I, then I believe we can move on. Sure, we can move on and we can start with presentation from Ashish. Yeah, I'll just share the screen. Uh, Molly, if you can confirm if my screen is visible. Yes, Vikram, it is visible. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, all of us have gone through tremendous number of calls in the last three days, I would say. So because of which a few of us are also having a sore throat. So uh, excuse us for that. So this particular council uh, meeting which has happened, the number of recommendations which have come up has actually made us uh, think on various uh, lines. But certainly, before we get into any conclusion, we all have to be very clear is that the various recommendations of the council, some of them have to undergo an amendment in the constitution, some require an amendment in the act, certain uh, proposals will actually come through uh, circulars. So when we deliberate each one of these recommendations, let us have this particular aspect in mind, because the limited commentary provided by the council through the press release and the uh, discussion by the finance minister in the press conference will be the primary guiding force and we will also share our thoughts on what would be the potential solution or way forward for certain unwritten or unanswered uh, points of the uh, GST council meeting. So we will start off uh, first with this uh, proposal by the council for uh, giving a relaxation of section 164 time limit. So Ashish. Uh, if you can throw some light, considering that recently the Kerala High Court in the case of uh, M-Trade had uh, given a retrospective application of the time extension of November to the previous financial years and also that uh, particular case of AP High Court of Tirmala Plywood where they actually touched upon the point that uh, once return is filed related beyond the time limit of 16-4, no benefit of ITC will be available. So, considering this recent background of this Kerala and uh, AP High Court, if you can throw some light on what the council has actually recommended in this uh, 53rd council meeting. Yeah. So, yes, Vikram. So, I think uh, one of the issue what has been going on since quite long in GST has been this time limit of taking input tax credit. So, while the law provides that we can take credit by the September and subsequently announced to November of subsequent financial year, many of the taxpayers, what they had done maybe because of the financial crunch or not knowing the consequences, returns for a particular financial year which was supposed to be filed by the due date of September of next year, some of those had filed later on after the September. So, let us say return for March 19. In order to take input tax credit, it should have been filed by 20th October 19. But maybe somebody could not file it uh, within time, filed belated and took the input tax credit pertaining to March 19 itself. We also recollect that in many cases, government had also come up with a late fee waiver in order to enhance the compliance uh, status also. So in all those cases also, people had... Uh, 
filed return belatedly taking the benefit of waiver of late fees technically what had happened in the government database if we look at simply what they do they just pick up the taxpayer whose return for a period up to march is filed after the september and they just take out the input tax credit availed in those 3b and question the itc availment thereon the matter has gone to various high courts some of the high courts have taken a view that your 16 for time limit is sacrosanct and it has to be abided by while the kerala high court has taken a view that uh, this amendment to november should be taken a retrospective effect i think all of us would recollect that uh, finance minister was jaipur during the uh, election time and a question was raised to her on this stage that this is an ongoing issue and largely for the sme sector also where it was promised that government would come up with some solution to this uh, after the uh, budget also so this being a prominent agenda item now the government has come up with the uh, some relaxation on this particular thing so now what the relaxation provides it says that if your input tax credit for 1718 to 2021 if this input tax credit is availed in any gstr 3b filed till 30th november 2021 then your input tax credit availed would be eligible input tax credit now first look at why they took 30th november 21 because that was the last date at different point of time where this extension uh, waiver etc were given from the late filing fees also so that is why they have chosen that cut off date of 30th november 2021 uh, but if you look at the press release it brings a very important <laughs> question to ponder upon the question is uh, the question is let us say for example for 1718 input tax credit i missed to take it in any return for the september of the next year which was later on let us say extended till march 19 let us say gstr 9 when it was prepared in 2020 then some tax payer observed that some credit might have been missed by him and that credit was taken let us say in the december 2019 gstr 3b that is after the statutory date of the time limit whether that input tax credit would be eligible or any input tax credit which availed in a proper 3b which was to be filed by september but there was delay in filing 3b so that input tax credit is sought to be uh, i would say permitted in this Uh, retrospective amendment so if you look at interpretation 1 so in this interpretation 1 if i am filing any 3b in any 3b can i take the benefit or if uh, this itc which is availed in a proper 3b which should have been filed by september but instead of september let us say it was filed post september so while the language is little ambiguous of the press release but if you look at this entire intent of uh, giving this benefit it appears that the benefit is extended for those tax payers who had availed the credit in a proper 3b but for some reason or other due to financial constraint or in ignorance those 3b were filed your post september due date so it is very unlikely that government will extend the benefit to the tax payer if let us say for 1718 invoice itc is taken in the gstr 3b of let us say october 21 those type of instances in my view may not cover in this relaxation but yes we need to wait for the uh, uh, i would say finer print of the amendment what is being proposed in the law and very important like you mentioned in the, in the beginning this is going to be by way of amendment in the act itself and amendment in the act as we all know that budget is on anvil so all these amendment in the act would be introduced uh, through the budget session of the parliament while this was one of the issue second issue in this itself was that sometime what happens a taxpayer returns get cancelled by department or it gets suspended 
and during the suspended period or the cancelled period taxpayer cannot file their return and cannot take the input tax credit now let us say in the interim period the time limit of september or november crosses later on let us say department restore the registration but at that point of time if taxpayer wants to take the itc it become time bar under 164 so here the taxpayer gets penalized for something which is not in under his control so what the council is proposing here the here the time limit of 30th 11 uh, 2021 is not applicable in the second uh, second case so here what the council is proposing if your registration is cancelled or suspended by department in that situation once it is revoked and if you are filing your return within a specified period of that revocation so that specified period of revocation shall prevail over 164 time limit so in those cases even if you could not meet the time limit of november of subsequent year because you were suspended during that period but let us say your suspension take place in december so if you are filing your return let us say by january uh, next year within one month let us say so in that situation your input tax credit would be held to be eligible you would not be subjected to the uh, rigorous time limit of 164 which otherwise is eligible this appears to be the intent of this entire amendment while we speak on this there are certain open question open issues uh, in this uh, uh, retrospective amendment in first and biggest issue is many of the people were compelled pay or compelled to reverse the input tax credit in the course of department proceedings those proceedings were either uh, uh, what you call maybe through audit or the scrutiny or the investigation or so so now the question would arise that the taxpayer who has already paid the amount maybe with or without interest penalty would they be entitled to avail this benefit of retaking the credit or would they not be entitled to take this benefit here one thing i would like to put across before all of you that in this budget or oh sorry in this council meeting government is coming up with a new section that is section 11 capital a that section is dealing with any of those instances where government gives some benefit on ages various basis so like what we would be discussing in some time that for insurance sector they have said that uh, in case of co-insurance premium there is no liability like in the past we recollect for the ice cream they have said that uh, whatever people have done in the past we will not touch it but for the future this will be a particular rate of tax in order to enable those type of situation government has introduced section 11a there were similar section used to be under the central excise and the custom sector now the question comes that whenever any clarification or I would say benefit is given by the council by way of insertion of that entry or under the section 11a there appears to be restriction on the refund so if somebody had paid taxes on the ice cream let us say at the higher rate in the past but government clarifies that uh, it is not liable or liable at lesser rate then in that situation the person who has paid higher tax cannot claim the refund but here when we are talking about this particular amendment this amendment is not coming under the section 11a this amendment is likely to take place by way of amendment in the 16.4 itself and when we are looking at the amendment in the 16.4 the question would arise can i claim the refund of input tax credit what i had what i was made liable to reverse by the department action in the past there is no clarity as of now in the council uh, release but the way this entire things have happened over last five six years they may come up with uh, those restriction and that is where any amnesty scheme where people who are the compliant or who wish to avoid the litigation they always end up in uh, being on the poor side so in case if there are any restriction by the government on the refund then certainly the taxpayer would have no option but to reach to the court or we also need to see on the finer print whether the restriction uh, that uh, whatever is on the refund can the restriction is there on the recredit also so let us say if i filed 3b in 2020 pertaining to 1718 once i had taken credit in that 3b 
now when the government is regularizing that credit any amount what i had reversed in the past in that gstr cb on the department intervention now can i claim that once i had taken the credit within the time limit for the first time re credit of the same cannot be questioned by department and i should be entitled to take credit in my view merely because this amnesty has come the people who were made liable to pay should not get suffer on account of that but yes we need to wait for the finer print of the uh, council uh, that amendment what is going to be in the act so like this uh, there could be many people who could be in the appeal so writ matters so in those situation also if uh, one need to take this benefit certainly it would be better to withdraw the matters for uh, withdraw the matters from the writ or appeal in order to claim benefit again question will come that if somebody had uh, paid the interest also while reversing the input tax credit can they claim refund of the interest again will depend on whether what type of provision government is going to come with if there are restriction on refund that interest refund could get become difficult unless we reach out to the court because unlike uh, what you call input tax credit which i can reavail myself in 3b here the reavailment or the interest whatever i have paid there is no provision for the su moto taking benefit of that interest paid so these are some of the issues again the cancel dealer how this will have 16 for impact and maybe delayed filing of r1 by supplier so these things are open issues before the industry let us wait and see how the council is going to come up with this proposed amendment to finally evaluate the impact under the 164 vikram anything you feel which uh, under 164 uh, which uh, our audience should take care of uh, uh, at this stage of the clarity whatever has come up with yeah i think one learning for all of us is that uh, even in the past where the clients have approached on the 164 issue whichever clients uh, we have uh, litigated the matter so this relief will be available certainly the same can be applied in your uh, example also ashish wherever you see a, a small hope or a, a, a small light in the tunnel i think it is always worth litigating the matter but not at the cost of incurring uh, uh, a higher litigation cost as compared to the benefit but uh, these kind of uh, exceptional moves by the government certainly can be taken advantage of yes so i think the second uh, and the one of the again biggest uh, uh, relief where vikram we would like to understand from you that yeah we all know that since beginning uh, actually the tribunal has not come in place there were extended extension in the gstr 9 and there have been extension by government in the time limit under 73 and 74 so in many cases what we have seen that the demand what has been imposed on the taxpayer in the interest on that demand if let us say any matter is of 17 18 the interest itself is crossing the basic uh, tax liability also so this government has come up with uh, this clarification or the benefit uh, of waiving wa uh, this waiving the interest and penalty but when i see it i do see like many issues coming that uh, uh, when would i be entitled to take this benefit if i am litigating the matter can i claim that benefit if i am at the appeal stage versus at audit stage what if notice was issued to me under 74 uh, can i claim this benefit also so there are various queries what we are getting from the taxpayer maybe your uh, analysis based on this council uh, Uh, clarification as to how should taxpayer proceed on this particular part yeah so interestingly uh, we have come across various cases where say the uh, assessee has a de tax demand of only 3 lakhs but the interest penalty put together with the tax amount itself is about 7 and 1/2 lakhs so that is the, a very dicey situation for the assessee also because the interest cost was too burdensome however there have been very various cases where uh, to avoid further litigation the taxpayers could have settled the demand at that stage itself now here we have an interesting case where uh, the council has uh, recommended insertion of a new provision which is section 128a i think majority of the discussion in the last few days is primarily on this particular topic where there is a conditional waiver of interest and penalty it is only on interest and penalty there is no waiver or a scheme to give a benefit of tax uh, liability reduction so this waiver is available only if the total gst demand has been discharged by the taxpayer on or before 31st of march of 2025 so the financial years covered in this particular amnesty scheme are the first three years of gst implementation 
so also if you look at the logic is that the time limit for issuance of show cause notice under the normal period has lapsed uh, has completed for the fi 1920 so that is why they have considered the first three years the benefit of waiver is not available if you decide not to pay a particular demand in the show cause notice or the order so instance you have five issues covered in the show cause notice four of the uh, demands in the notices you have decided okay you can settle the matter but there is one major demand which you want to contest the waiver in this particular uh, provision will be available only if all the five demands are settled if the assessee does not decide or does not want to settle all the demands then this waiver will not be applicable to that taxpayer interestingly again the same challenge of people who in the past had settled the interest and penalty as a matter of uh, prudence of time and cost they will be on the uh, adverse footing because there is no refund of interest and penalty which is available to the taxpayer certainly if you are contesting the matter at the higher forum either at the commissioner appeals forum or you are waiting for the gstat to be formed certainly this amnesty scheme can be a good uh, recourse for you to close the matter specifically the council has made a mention that this waiver will not cover demands which are on account of erroneous refund the uh, intent behind this exclusion appears to be uh, very clear that in case of refund where the government has made excess disbursement to the taxpayer so uh, in such scenarios they do not want to give this waiver of interest and penalty so now there are certain points like what ashish also mentioned uh, do require clarity but let us see if we can uh, dissect and do our evaluation to identify the possible clarity which we can uh, consider as a solution. So if there are notices which are issued under 74, because if you see the amnesty relief which is being provided, it is very clear that the relief is provided only in case the demand under the show cause notice has been raised uh, under section 73. But as we all know, the department to overcome their limitations of not issuing the notices within the normal time uh, period, they will always uh, take recourse under 74. And there are certain set of officers, whether or not the time limit has lapsed, will always look at 74 because a higher amount of penalty can be imposed. So if the taxpayer was originally issued notice under 74, but the appellate authority later decides that 74 does not sustain and it has to be adjudicated under 73. There is no clarity today in the press release, but going by the intent of the government to waive off the past interest and penalty with the intent to minimize the litigation uh, with the taxpayers, this amnesty scheme should be available. Only point is we have to wait and watch what is the time limit given for such amnesty scheme because there is an overall, overall time limit of 31st March 25. Assuming my matter is adjudicated and closed by the appellate authority only in April of 25, then I will be losing on the opportunity of amnesty. So we uh, personally feel that there should be a specific clarity on this and an extended due date should be given for such cases. Uh, Vikram, uh, yes, sir. just one point there which I would like to ask you. So if as a taxpayer I have received notice under 74 or so, in that situation, how would you suggest should i strictly because if i let us say pay the sometime what happens that if i pay the base amount interest and 15 percent penalty under 74 my matter would uh, get closed but like you said that it is not there is no clarity as of now but looking at the intent uh, the benefit should be given in those cases also that uh, 73 it gets adjudicated or uh, appeal it appeal stays converted into 70 the benefit should be given so the focus of the taxpayer, how should that focus be there that they put across this 74 ka conversion into 73? So would you just put a little more practical insight for the taxpayer as to how they should contest their matter in those situations? Yeah, yeah. I firmly believe that about 99% of the department proceedings under 74 will never sustain because they, they do not have proper basis to justify the uh, provision invoked in such cases under 74. So wherever the show cause notice has been issued, certainly this matter has to be uh, contested. And if possible, when you are contesting the matter, because the authority also have an option to move the demand from 74 to 73, if that communication can also be made as an uh, without prejudice uh, submission, 
it is possible that we can get the matter converted to 73 and then look for uh, the, dis the discharge of the GST liability. But uh, paying the penalty at 15 percentage uh, certainly is not something which I would want to do. But uh, as the amnesty stands today, Ashish, since 74 is specifically excluded, I think it has to be contested and uh, hope to uh, get it converted to 73. Yes. So wherever the matters are already in appeal or writ, where you are contesting the particular demand, uh, primarily where the, uh, the exposure of interest and penalty was uh, the deciding factor for the SSC to go for appeal. So in such cases, you can explore the possibility of withdrawing the appeal or the writ and uh, then opt for the amnesty scheme by discharging the tax liability. Uh, now, what in cases where the appellate authority has also decided the matter and you are uh, possibly waiting for the GSTAT to be formed. So, even in such cases, uh, once you settle the tax liability, the entire matter would be considered to be closed. So, I think this is a very good uh, scheme available, specifically in cases where the tax demands are not significantly high and the complete waiver of interest and penalty can be sought for. So, this is only for the first three years. We all hope that the government may consider such further amnesty in the future period. But let us wait and watch uh, and uh, follow what is currently available with us. Maybe Vikram, a couple of points I would just also like to add in the previous deliberation. So sometime what has happened in some of the states, uh, audit has taken place for a particular uh, period. But the culmination of that audit has resulted into separate show cause notice for separate audit para. In some of the state, it has been done that way. So probably those taxpayers are at a better footing today because it talks about the entire demand of a particular show cause notice being discharged. So out of those 10 audit paras, if I feel okay, it is worth foregoing to six paras, which have converted into six show cause notice. Yes, I could possibly look at uh, this particular benefit. But the problem would be in those cases, Vikram, I think where sometime central department or so have taken the block of period of audit. So now let us say period following is 1819, 1920 and 2021, where there are various issues involved. Now out of those three years, only two years are covered in the amnesty scheme, but not the third year. So how would, uh, whether that proportionate or pro rata payment of tax liability would uh, deem to be satisfaction of this condition of the amnesty scheme? Again, I would say, uh, not a clear matter how all those things would be there or so. But yeah. uh, if I look at maybe one more example, many of the people were made liable to pay ITC reversal on account of non-payment within 180 days. In those cases, the liability happens to be only for the interest or so because ITC anyway, if I take later on, it becomes regularized. So these type of issues where there were some uh, delays for some compliance or so where only interest liability etc is there it is going to be very uh, beautiful position for those taxpayers where they can get away with uh, uh, this entire demand of interest or penalty what would have been imposed by department on them as a business as a consultant what we need to keep in mind to dig out all the past submission made to see what submission are going to be made in the near future for various open matters start including this as one of the ground in this submission so that it should not happen tomorrow that this pray itself has not been made but i believe yes government will come out with specific procedure also for this amnesty scheme to get the benefit but there is no harm in start taking this additional ground in the uh, all future submission by the time scheme is notified yeah, importantly, your question on that block period, uh, I believe that even if I have a consolidated notice for a period even extending beyond 1920, but the adjudicating authority certainly would be quantifying the demand on year on year basis, then there is an overall demand. Considering that this is a beneficial provision which is being inserted with the clear intent to closure uh, have a closure of the past demands. This uh, amnesty benefit should be available at least till the period of 1920, even if the demand for the entire notice is not being settled, because the settlement happens only till the period which is covered under this particular amnesty scheme. But as you mentioned, we'll have to wait for the relevant uh, notifications and amendments in the law. Uh, coming next, Ashish, uh, there are certain clarifications with regard to the time limit for availment of credit. 
where the taxpayer has actually discharged the liability and the reverse charge there have been uh, numerous uh, uh, views which are floating around in terms of the time limit under 164 to what extent it has to be applied whenever a taxpayer is discharging uh, rcm liability if you can throw some light on what is the clarification given by the council so uh, vikram very briefly if uh, uh, if it touches upon this issue uh, in pre gst regime we all know that rcm input tax credit was eligible based on tr6 salan once i pay the tax liability in gst what government has proposed that in case of any supply received from unregistered supplier the recipient has to take input tax uh, uh, recipient has to pay the uh, tax liability under rcm with respect to 93 liabilities or 94 in the initial period and recipient has to generate the self invoice also so the question what was before the trade at large is when should i look at my itc eligibility so let us say for any tax issue of 1718 audit took place in 22 in the course of audit department sought to uh, uh, claim some rcm liability against me which i was compelled to pay in the audit proceeding now the question comes that because this supply pertain to 1718 can i take input tax credit of that rcm liability which i am discharging in the financial year of 2022-23 where already 16 for time limit has crossed over so that was an ongoing issue now what the uh, council is intending to clarify in this particular stuff is that levy of tax liability under rcm is independent of itc eligibility so while the time of supply provisions under your section 13 read with section 31 provides for the rcm liability that within 60 days from the date of receipt of supply or so so that is the time limit for paying the taxes but in case if it happens to be delay in payment of rcm liability it would normally be presumed that taxpayer was ignorant at the initial stage because he was ignorant so later on it was when it was pointed out to him he paid the tax liability and because he is paying at the later stage certainly the corollary to that self invoice is also expected to be raised at the point of time of paying the tax liability in my example 22 23 so when the self invoice is generated in 22 23 tax is also paid in 22 23 along with the interest because time of supply had already taken place in 17 18 so what the uh, press release says that in these cases the itc eligibility should be seen not from the date in which supply has taken place but from the date on which i have raised the self invoice post payment of tax in cash uh, under the rcm so in this example my time limit under 164 would get counted from the 22 23 when i had paid the tax under the rcm it also if you look at this uh, uh, clarification this is giving very uh, i would say power or making this self invoice as a substantive document till now if we see in the industry what we have seen that self invoice is little more neglect neglected compliance where people tend to feel that once tax is paid disclosed in 3b entry passed in books of account they can take the input tax credit in gstr1 also many time people are not declaring the self invoice uh, series also considering this entire proposition i would urge i would recommend that the self invoice compliance to be taken strictly because here this document is becoming a substantive document for you to taking the input tax credit so all the compliance around this should be appropriately taken care of while the clarification is good it also again like other discussion opens certain additional challenges now the first challenge what is coming is if my supplier is registered so let us say there is a registered transporter who had raised invoice on me under the rcm provision now in that case whether the 164 verification under rcm would be applicable or not 
where I fail to pay the liability timely, which I am paying today after two, three, four years when department audit is taking place. So here, if you look at here, if you look at the section 313 uh, clause F, which provides for generation of self invoice. It provides for generation of self invoice only in those cases where supplier is unregistered. If supplier is registered under the GST law, the onus is on supplier to raise the tax invoice with a mark in the end that tax is to be paid by the recipient under reverse charge. If you see the format of tax invoice or maybe e invoice format, there is a specific declaration to that effect. So in these cases, the underlying document for me to take the credit is that tax invoice what is issued by the supplier along with the fact that I have paid tax liability thereon. So if, if we look at the clarification of the council, it specifically uses the word unregistered supplier. It does not use the word any type of supply under the RCM. So here there could be a challenge where the ITC if paid delayed could be denied by the department saying that your document of the supplier pertained to the original time period. So we have to be little uh, conscious of this compliance. We need to see when the entire circular comes as to how the government is intending to clarify on this point second also if you look at many time uh, when it is uh, when it come across in the proceeding for rcm not paid department does not permit us to pay in 3b they insist for to pay it through drc03 because they want to take credit that it was unearthed in the course of audit or scrutiny or so many taxpayers have raised this question can we take itc of the drc uh, rcm paid through drc03 in our view, though there is no clarification, but in our view, as we mentioned, the substantive document is the self-invoice. Once the factum of payment of tax liability to the government is discharged, irrespective of the mode through which the tax is paid, it should not uh, be resulting in denial of my input tax credit. So even if you are compelled to pay through DRC-03, yes, you can take the input tax credit on that particular thing. But again, this one is the question on the time limit. Okay. Second question, what comes? Can I take credit in all the situation? Whenever I am made liable to pay tax during the department uh, proceeding, can I take input tax credit in all the situation? Here we need to be aware of the provision of section 17, subsection 5, clause I, which says that any tax paid in pursuance of the proceeding under section 79, uh, 74, 129, 130, in those cases, ITC cannot be claimed. So if it happens to be, let us say, audit of department where the uh, proceeding is initiated under 74 and if we are paying tax under that particular uh, proceeding. So would that credit be denied merely because the fact that department has initiated proceeding under 74? Certainly not. Because merely allegation of fraud cannot be said to be conclusion of that uh, allegation that yes, the taxpayer has actually created a fraud or suppression or so. So even if you are compelled to pay tax in the proceeding initiated under 74, you make sure that DRC 03, if you are paying anything, let it be paid under 73 only. Your There should be a communication to the department on record that this amount we are paying, uh, uh, whatever under 73 itself, even though the proceeding are initiated under 74. And take the input tax credit. Later on, if litigated by department, it is worth litigating because uh, we are very sure that you would be entitled to take credit in all these cases. So these are some of the aspects which are uh, relevant to this RCM ITC, uh, which government has clarified. Anything Ashi, your input yeah, on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe one interesting scenario could be, say, if, uh, the company for the financial year 1819, they had missed to discharge this RCM liability, which uh, post the audit, they had paid it in, say, 21-22. Now the question is when the RCM liability in itself was discharged in 21-22, but due to lack of clarity, they had not availed the credit. So can they take a possible view with this circular that though I had discharged my RCM liability in 21-22, can I raise a self-invoice today to take the benefit of credit? Would that be a possible option, Ashish? Certainly, Vikram. I think it is, uh, uh, as of now, it has been a gone case for me sunk case for me again if we look at this entire release or otherwise my timing of issuing self invoice is not guided by the 
department in this clarification so if i because at that point of time i did not raise the self invoice on the understanding that i anyway i cannot take the input tax credit so why to raise the self invoice certainly yes i can raise the self invoice today also the fact that it is clarified by the government so uh, it should not happen that i am uh, deprived of the benefit of a government clarification merely because i had done something in the past in my bona fide cases so i am of the very clear view it is worth raising the self invoice today take the itc based on that self invoice if litigated by department worth litigation but yeah henceforth after this clarification anything is observed by department where we are liable to pay at that point of time develop the habit of raising the self invoice at the same point of time without further delaying to the future period yeah maybe one philosophy which uh, we can consider is that whenever in doubt with regard to input tax credit you can consider the option of taking credit and maintain the sufficient balance of itc so that uh, after 2 years when say there is a high court ruling which actually allows this benefit at that point of time you should not uh, get into a situation where this particular benefit of credit is not available to you so maybe that philosophy can be considered specifically when it's a matter involving itc uh, yeah, yes, even in respect of assess credit of tran one where the when the amendment was taken place the time limit was uh, counted from that date not from the original date or so yeah yeah so uh, maybe vikram i think uh, this time council has come up with many uh, bold and out of the box ideas also so when this entire new thought process what has been seen is this insertion of section 74a where in uh, yes as of now where there are the differentiation between 73 and 74 in terms of time limit of issuing the notice time limit of passing the order uh, impact on my penalty if i if it happens to be assessed under 73 74 sometime if assessed under 74 the impact under income tax also because uh, if it happens to be let us say some uh, allegation of the bogus cases or so where the corresponding provision is made an income tax also to levy the penalty so this new provision of 74a where the government is uh, what the government is actually trying to do what could be the intent behind it and how could it have ramification for the taxpayers so my personal view is this particular uh, insertion of 74a is primarily for uh, safeguarding the revenue leakages which is happening due to the inefficiencies or i would say lack of proper planning by the department so my personal feeling is this is not a beneficial provision for the ssc i personally feel that this is having some adverse effect for the industry because earlier you have two time limits one under 73 which was only 3 years and 5 years under section 74 and as i firmly believe that 99% of the cases will never uh, qualify to be fitting under 74 now because of this inefficiencies of the department Uh, more often than not they will resort to 74 and there could also be cases where scn is issued beyond 3 years which is 2 years 9 months and 3 months for adjudication though the council has not specifically mentioned what would be the uh, common time limit for both 73 and 74 together i personally fe- feel it would be a period which is in between 73 and 74 do not expect a period which is going to be certainly less than 73 so when we have a period of 3 year and 5 year somewhere a four year could be a period where they can decide to have a common time limit for adjudication of matters and uh, the period of uh, coverage under 74a would commence from financial year 23 24 only this primarily appears to be because for the financial year 22 23 already the annual return has been filed by december of 23 so the the council also has looked at the future period when annual returns are going to be filed so for fi 23 24 when the re- annual return will be filed on 31st december 2024 the time limit as it stands today the time uh, the period of limitation under 74 will be considered accordingly so if they decide 4 years it will be 4 years from that date it does not matter whether it is a genuine case or a case where the allegation of suppression and fraud is existing the time limit would be a common uh, time period the current provision uh, of uh, section 73 and 74 actually gives a window of 30 days to the taxpayer to settle the tax demand and have a, uh, a limited uh, amount of penalty to be discharged 
So where you are required to pay 100% penalty under say 74, there is a lower penalty base given if you are willing to settle in 30 days. So they are also giving a extended date of 60 days for the taxpayer to decide whether they want to settle the matter or not. Quantum of penalty, the council has not recommended any reduction in the amount of penalty, 100% and 10% of 74 and 73 respectively continues uh, to exist. No specific uh, reduction in the percentage of penalty has been proposed. So this particular amendment of 74A will not be applicable for the period up to FI 22-23. It is only from 23-24 that this provision will be applicable. And I still of the I am of the firm view that this is not a beneficial uh, change for the taxpayers. Certainly, having uh, more of a safeguarding done for the uh, shortfalls and the shortcomings by the uh, department. So, so anything. Vikram, uh, yeah. yeah, Vikram. One point of uh, uh, this concern here is so going forward, a bona fide taxpayer and a fraudulent taxpayer is government saying that. We do not treat both of you separately. Come together. We will treat you in the similar manner. Is it what government is saying? Or are they saying, okay, even if in terms of time limit, we will catch hold you within the same time limit. But once you get catch hold, still we would differentiate between uh, you two because of that situation. So how that is being affected? I feel it is the latter case, Ashish, where the differentiation has been retained by way of the penalty. It is more so that the officers, because of the multiple dates, they always tend to miss out on the 73 time limit. So it is more intended to protect the interest of revenue from the perspective of the, uh, uh, I would say, the deficiencies in the way the department is functioning. So I, I don't see that the genuine taxpayer and the taxpayer who's having an intent to defraud are still kept on the same uh, pedestal. So there is certainly a distinction today what uh, exists in terms of uh, penalty. But uh, personally, Vikram, if I look at this, uh, this is a retrograde step of government because in income tax also, if we see 143, 148, there are different time limit. In the all the past indirect taxes, always there used to be different time limit. Now when government is sitting at so much data and information or so, Again, why does the government need for four years, for example, if let us say if they take, let us say three and a half year, four year or so, and that too from the annual return date. So why do they need that much uh, time period? Because for any taxpayer, that interest cost is... Hello. Uh, Ashish, you're there. Uh, can someone confirm if I am audible or uh, I don't know? Yes, Vikram, you are audible to us. Yeah, yeah. So, so certainly, Ashish and Vikram, you yeah, are audible to us. So, certainly, this is not a, a, I would say, a beneficial move. So, I certainly agree to the point that it is an adverse uh, uh, provision which is going to be implemented specifically for the genuine taxpayers but the intent of the government to still have the distinction appears to exist because of the different penalty norms which are uh, in place today uh, can, can someone confirm is ashish has joined no he is not joined yet he is not joined <laughs> okay so we'll proceed with the discussion yeah. Uh, we can continue uh, till he joins. Yes, sir. So the next uh, clarification which has been provided or a recommendation given by the council is uh, with regard to the corporate guarantee, where many of the taxpayers in the recent uh, few months have faced the enquiries from the department side, specifically to ensure that uh, the taxpayers have discharged applicable GST under RCM or under forward charge for this corporate guarantee transactions. So with this regard, last year there was an amendment in Rule 28.2 where they had inserted a deeming provision of 1% to be the valuation in cases where this uh, corporate guarantee has been offered or the actual consideration, whichever is higher. So that was a amendment uh, made under Rule 28. Because of this amendment, there are various confusions amongst the industry and the professionals 
for example whether this corporate guarantee ka 1% i have to compute for every year whether i have to take the actual guarantee amount given or the guarantee amount utilized because you may have various cases say the holding company has given a corporate guarantee of 10 crores to their subsidiary but the subsidy and it's a blanket uh, guarantee given by the holding company but for uh, practical use the subsidiary might have used only 4 crore of the entire uh, 10 crore basket uh, or the umbrella given by the holding company so in that cases there were lot of uh, doubts whether the entire 10 crore has to be considered for the purpose of this 1% valuation or we can restrict the value based on the actual usage of the corporate guarantee so various uh, uh, doubts and queries existed in the industry now the clarifications provided by the council are on various lines the first clarification is when my rule 28 also has a deeming fiction where the other person is eligible for full credit with regard to that proviso then whether i can still take shelter of that proviso ignoring that one percent amount of guarantee which has been offered now. So here even zero has been considered to be a value that uh, benefit of the provision has also been extended here. And this particular val deemed valuation would not be applicable for export of services. Yeah, Certain points, Ashish. Yeah. So yeah. So the issue in case of uh, export was that if my subsidiary is outside India. And because uh, this is a deeming provision of paying the tax liability, so I cannot realize the full value from the subsidiary. So my export of service definition says that if you do not realize the full value, it will not be treated as the export of service. So that was a question where the council is uh, now contemplating to exclude the recipient who are based outside India, outside India under the uh, this uh, amended provision. So that is how this benefit is sought to be yeah. given for the parties outside India. Maybe one of the thought process Ashish which the council has taken is that the benefit of uh, the provision under Rule 28 applies to a recipient who is eligible for full credit. In case of export transactions, since the recipient itself is outside India, the question of uh, full credit does not arise. So maybe that also could be a thought process to uh, say, mention that this uh, deeming will not be applicable. Yes. So maybe uh, if you look at some of the open issues which uh, council is uh, uh, council has been expected to take and where the industry has represented also one issue has been this one percent mechanism is it per annum basis or let us say if guarantee is given for five years so one percent into five how should it be paid so if you look at the exact wording of the present rule it does not say the one percent per annum but the basis which this rule has been introduced is the safe harbor rule under the income tax under, under the transfer pricing where it says that uh, the uh, corporate guarantee will whichever is higher so if under the income tax act provision whatever provides for annual valuation if that type of uh, interpretation is clarification is given by the council then certainly they have to make uh, a suitable amendment in the rule if that happens to be, then uh, the liability would be on per annum basis. Second, uh, could be the situation where, let us say, guarantee is given for 20 crore rupees, but actual loan is taken only for 5 crore rupees by the uh, borrower. So in that situation, whether liability is on 10 cro or 20 crore or 5 crore. So in our view, that liability should be on the total value of guarantee extended, not on the value of benefit or facility enjoyed by the beneficiary from the bank qua that guarantee also. So accordingly, the value of guarantee need to be considered. Similarly, for co-guarantors where, uh, let us say, uh, two guarantors are there for a single uh, facility sought to be taken by the beneficiary from the bank. So in that situation, it cannot happen that if 10 crore is the value of loan, so 1% for the guarantor A, 1% for guarantor B. That is not, uh, that cannot be the right proposition. So again, in our view, uh, this uh, should be taken in totality and the respective share should be charged by the respective uh, party. If recipient is not eligible for full ITC, in fact, that is the biggest problem and that is the biggest area where government wants to take this benefit of, let us say, infra sector or real estate sector or where this guarantee is extended, but the recipient can't take the credit. Now, because credit cannot be taken, 
this open market value would uh, come into picture o overseas company so again if we what we mentioned that uh, uh, if my foreign company is outside india which is given guarantee in india so that other clarification what government has come up in this council meeting and the last circular on the internally generated service of cross charge or so where the zero value itself has been treated to be a fair value where the recipient is eligible for itc so if that zero value rule is permitted i can certainly take that benefit on the import of service provision also in fact many of the cases department after this new rule inserted they have started demanding tax liability for the past period also saying that if somebody had paid at 0.3% they are asking for 1% or so so whether this should be retrospective certainly not because this notification what was issued under the rule was the prospective and any valuation mechanism what was not provided for in the past government cannot bring a not uh, valuation provision in future and impose it for the past period or so so i think in the past whatever has been paid by anybody should be fine if it recipient was eligible to take credit then proviso benefit was fine if nobody has paid the tax certainly one can take an argument that uh, there was no valuation mechanism itself provided so that uh, our income tax uh, judgment landmark srinivasa shetty that if valuation is not there then my charging itself fail so for the past this rule cannot be extended and uh, taxpayer would be at sound footing to uh, not to pay the tax liability under the new rule but the question come can i if i if i have let us say paid interest in last 10 months since the introduction in october or so can i claim refund of the same in our view certainly yes because this is not an 11a notification clarification item this is more of a clarification in circular coupled with the appropriate amendment in the rule so when it is not an 11a item there would be any uh, restriction on claiming there it is not expected that there would be any restriction on claiming the refund so you need to see your books if anything has been paid in the past you could issue the credit not not if it is within the well defined time period especially so if recipient uh, at the recipient end credit is getting accumulated if any interest has been paid certainly you could uh, consider to claim that uh, interest refund also because this amendment or clarification is going to have the uh, retrospective effect from the october 23 since the time when this rule itself was introduced so these are some of the interesting aspect on corporate guarantee let us await for the final circular from the government on this line yes vikram uh just one uh, two points i will add ashish one is uh, i think all of us have to look back in terms of what all interest we have paid in the last 4 uh, 5 years and see all the possibilities of claiming refund specifically for corporate guarantee ashish say the corporate guarantee is actually entered the agreement for uh, cg is entered only in say august of a particular financial year so the computation is per annum basis per financial year basis how does that uh, work out is there any clarity on that so if the interest is paid uh, uh, for this particular thing uh, as i mentioned that 11a is not going to be there no my question is not on interest it is on the timing of that one year which you mentioned right possibly it could be on an annum basis basis the safe harbor computation so so i think uh, vikram how it could be because this cannot be said to be a continuous supply of service that is for sure this activity of giving this guarantee is one time event where the benefit is enjoyed over a period so like that insurance example if we pay the insurance health insurance nowadays let us say we, we pay for three year also to claim some discount so in that situation it cannot be said that it is a continuous supply it is a one time supply where the benefit is enjoyed over a period of three years so if the council takes a view that this 1% is taken to be in the similar way as under the income tax on per annum basis so let us say if the guarantee is given for 3 years so that 1% into 3 so if 10 crore is the your value of the guarantee so 1% would become uh, uh, what you call 10 lakh rupees into 3 years 30 lakh rupees into 18% okay. that is how possibly it could come across fine ashish so we can proceed yeah so vikram again this very uh, interesting issue that uh, while government had amended section 50 to provide that if there is buffer uh, uh, input tax credit then reversal thereof is not uh, required to pay the interest but there were uh, 
uh, many issues. In fact, uh, you, we recollect that in the beginning year itself, at, at 1920, there was judgment of Telangana High Court where it was says that this amount paid in the cash ledger, it is somewhere in the cloud. It does not reach to the government. So when it does not reach to the government, you cannot say that liability is discharged because in 3B, you have to set it off. But uh, recent judgment uh, uh, had taken some different views. So when a taxpayer pays certain amount, which is lying in the cash ledger, but for some reason or other, he is not able to set it off. So department has claimed the interest always on that particular thing. So what your view in terms of the legality of those action of department, the proposal of the council, and how could one look at for the past period? if one had already happened to pay the interest on the department demand. Yes, Ashish. I think it is becoming a trend where uh, the GST council has uh, proposed certain amendments based on the rulings of uh, uh, Madras High Court, I would say. Uh, the earlier case where the amendment in section 50 on the aspect of electronic credit ledger came after uh, there were rulings, say, I, I remember there was Mansar over uh, case by Madras High Court, which said that uh, credit is as good as tax paid, basis the earlier precedents which we had, Dai Ichiar Karya and uh, Aishar Motors. So that precedent was set and then uh, it uh, paved the way for the amendment in section 50. Now, recently we have another ruling by Madras High Court in the case of again Aishar Motors itself, where the SSC there had deposited the money in the electronic cash ledger and uh, uh, the returns were filed belatedly. Only the return filing was delayed, but the deposit of money in the cash ledger was done within the due date itself. So this particular uh, uh, ruling of Madras High Court has actually looked at the provision of section 49, where there is an explanation which clearly gives a deeming fiction that the credit of money in the government bank account will be deemed to be the date on which the credit is made to the electronic cash ledger. So this particular ruling has in my view paved the way for this particular amendment so the council has proposed that uh, rule 88b which actually gives the mechanism for computation of interest in case of such delays by the taxpayer so the council has made a recommendation that wherever the cash ledger has a balance as on the date of the due date of filing of 3b to that extent the interest computation would not be required only where the actual remittance has happened beyond the due date of filing of 3B, the interest computation has to be considered. But does it mean that all the concerns and queries of the taxpayers are addressed? In my view, no. Certainly, few more rulings by uh, the various high courts, specifically and particularly say Madras High Court, if they come across such the following issues which I am going to express, maybe further amendments may be brought in the law. First question is, the rule 88b provides for the waiver or the relaxation of interest specifically in cases where there is a delay in filing of return say my due date was 20th i have filed it on say 25th the delay of five days interest will not be applicable provided i had sufficient balance either in my cash ledger or my credit ledger to that extent i'm safeguarded but what if i have filed all my returns within the uh, statutory due dates but few invoices I had missed to discharge the liability when I filed the return for that particular month. Say the liability of April 24, I have filed my April return by 20th of May, but I have identified certain invoices not considered in my return computation, which I am discharging in my June 3, GSTR 3B return. Now, as per the current rule 88B, it appears that this particular benefit of relaxation is not being extended to such cases. Certainly, going by the intention and the, uh, the very basis taken by the High Court to ensure that interest is not imposed, uh, even in such cases, this interest implication should not be uh, applicable, provided you have sufficient balance in ECL or your electronic cash ledger. Vikram, now, on, lighter the, note, Vikram yeah. on lighter note, it seems that uh, what Niradji were talking about 1A, that 1A is hmm. short for that only that, okay, if you, if you hmm. have missed by 10th, you again reconcile by 20th and make sure that it is included so that uh, later on this issue is not there. So they have given me a nine day window, you are saying. Uh, yes. But certainly we will still stand before the High Court of Madras and challenge this uh, if there is an interest exposure. Uh, second is uh, again going back to the scenario what if interest was paid in the past? Because uh, I though I had cash balance, department did not accept and admit. So I was forced to maybe discharge the. Uh, interest liability or it was a 
uh, uh, a, a decision taken by the management to discharge the same. Certainly, again, going back to Ashish's observation, this is not covered under this 11A uh, proposal. This is an independent uh, 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 amendment which is going to be made in Rule 88B as well as uh, the interest provision of Section 50. So here we also have to very well consider the possibility of claiming the refund of interest which was paid in the past. Uh, anything else, Ashish, on this slide or we can... No more on this. Yeah. And Vikram, Ashish, I think we are left with almost 15 yeah. minutes. So I think the major uh, points we have covered, if you can quickly take us through this ESOP related uh, clarification which is going to come. So I think in the ESOP issue, the uh, when we look at the Economic Times or uh, various other medias, many people in the industry have received the notice from department where the department has proposed that if uh, some ESOP are given by a holding company, let us say based outside India, to an employee of the subsidiary company in India. And for that, some charge is recovered by the holding company from outside India, from uh, from the subsidiary company in India. So in that situation, whether Indian subsidiary company is liable to pay GST under the RCM to the extent cost imposed by the foreign holding company, or let us say if it is a domestic transaction in that situation, uh, uh, whether the Indian holding company is liable to charge GST to the subsidiary company. While the council press release is silent, it only says that uh, there will be clarification on the reimbursement of security as a part of ESOP. But what Vikram, uh, we had taken a view in the past also that this activity of recovering the cost by holding company from subsidiary company is nothing but a transaction in security which is outside GST. And also, if you look at from the angle of the Indian subsidiary company, which is recording this expenditure in books of, in its books of account, on account of the charge recovered by the foreign holding company, this is part of the compensation package, what it is giving to its employee. And once it is part of the compensation package on that expenditure, my Schedule 3 will uh, kick in and certainly I cannot be compelled to pay tax under the RCM. Yes. If there are any additional charges recovered by the holding company on some other facilitation stuff or so, those things, uh, unless uh, what you call covered in the composite supply, which is very unlikely, in those cases, to that extent, there could be the liability. This is what the view have taken. Uh, we have taken in some of the uh, these type of issues what have come in the past. Let us wait to see how the council uh, uh, clarifies on this particular aspect. Yeah, and hopefully the logic uh, also is considered by the council when they give this uh, particular clarification. Yeah. So again, uh, yeah, Vikram, maybe some more uh, litigation reduction steps if you could just uh, apprise all of us. Yeah, uh, even before this council meeting right from 2017, there is a provision in the GST law in section 120 where they have put, uh, they have given a provision where monetary limits would be prescribed or recommended by the council where no appeal would be preferred by the department where in case the amount of tax demand is less than the threshold which has to be recommended by the council. So it has uh, taken uh, almost seven years for uh, the council to give this recommendation and even while giving the recommendation uh, they have uh, referred to the threshold even, uh, limits given under the ERST-12 regime of central excise uh, though it's, it is slightly on the lesser side as compared to my central excise uh, threshold limits. One thing which has been made very clear is that this monetary limits would not be applicable for cases involving question involving the question of law or a particular provision in itself is being uh, challenged challenged and uh, before the court. So now the question is the threshold limit under the GST law has been made 20 lakhs for tribunal, 1 crore for high court and 2 crore for supreme court. Uh, it appears that uh, the council has completely set aside or ignored the aspect of the inflation or the additional uh, buffer which could have been given. So the, this is the threshold which has been proposed. Now the question is, this particular threshold limit is for the amount of tax in demand. There could be various cases where there is no demand of GST. The entire uh, notice and the order is for demand of interest and penalty which is in dispute. Now whether this monetary limit will also extend to these cases, though no specific clarity is available today, in our view, this threshold limit will also be applicable for cases involving only interest and penalty because the idea of this particular monetary limit is government also does not want to carry forward litigation 
on and on where the amount at stake is not significant so this interest penalty also should be considered as part of the monetary limit threshold similarly for uh, just one one point i think that point what you mentioned na question of flow yeah. i think that is very going to be crucial thing because if my 175 this entitlement is there if my exemption entry reading is there so many of the things which involve some interpretation those issues might not get covered into this but yeah these type of reconciliation based issues or so i think those would be the likely things covered into this uh, threshold limit uh, or so yeah uh with regard to filing of this appeal before the gstat uh we all know that there was this removal of difficulty order plus a circular was also issued clarifying that the time limit for filing of appeal will be uh, made at a future date because tribunal itself has not been uh, uh, in place so the higher limit of the date on which the president or the state president are uh, appointed and they enter the office was given as the threshold to commence the due date of uh, filing of appeal so recently in the month of uh, may uh, mr sanjay kumar mishra was appointed to the post of the president of the state with that appointment and the news uh, coming into the uh, coming before the uh, industry there were a lot of deliberation whether <coughs> the time limit has already started for filing of appeal before the gstat the irony is there is no physical gstat which is available today it is merely that the president has been appointed then uh, whether the time limit still has been kept on hold or it has been commenced has been a matter of a lot of deliberation without clarity so now the council has given a specific clarity even the finance minister in their press conference has made this clear <coughs> that uh, the time limit uh, for filing of appeal before the gstat would commence from a date which will be notified at a future date so we do not have to think too much and be under the pressure of filing of appeal before the gstat we have enough litigation and matters which have been uh, raked up by the department to take care for now on a lighter note so we will be waiting for the government to notify a date from which this 3 uh, month time limit for filing of appeal will be initial will commence uh, one more move towards uh, this particular relaxation by the government is uh, with regard to the amount of uh, pre deposit which has to be paid the existing limit of pre deposit is 10% for the first appellate authority with a value threshold of 25 crores the maximum threshold given is 25 crore each under cgst and sgst the proposed limit is retained at 10% but the value threshold has been reduced from 25 crore to 20 crore each which is 20 crore cgst 20 crore sgst for gstat the earlier pre deposit was 20% which was in addition to the 10% so effectively taxpayer was required to pay 30% if they are going to go on appeal before the gstat with a value threshold of 50 crore each now this has been proposed to be reduced to 10% with a ma maximum value uh, threshold of 20 crore each so certainly there is some relaxation given by the council to ease the cash flow burden on the taxpayer if they are going to proceed and file appeal before the tribunal ashish we have touched a few times on the section 11 so i think is not needed uh, we have already sufficiently on this so quickly we will go through this uh, key changes with regard to the insurance sector it is one of the major offshoot and the beneficiary from this introduction of section 11a where the insurance sector has gone through a lot of uh, pains in the last few years because of the practice taken by the industry as a whole so specifically only on the lead insurance uh, the co insurance point where the tax has been paid by the leader of the uh, consortium and uh, the members of the insurance uh, contract have not discharged the liability to the government so this has now been regularized on as is whereas basis and specifically they have proposed that the amount of premium received by the members would be declared declared as no supply under schedule 3 so similarly there were other industry issues which have been clarified in favor of the industry on as is whereas basis and uh, the regularization has been made by these proposals now wherever these matters are under litigation certainly will be uh, closed and if it is under writ certainly the uh, uh, 
mentioned before the high court is to be done to set aside and close the entire matter in hand in addition to this uh, lavene benefit uh, certain clarifications have been uh, mentioned that would be provided one is with regard to the salvage uh, uh, impact of salvage on insurance company i believe the decision will be more on line with whether there is an impact on input tax credit or it is going to be treated as an outward supply in the hands of the insurance company similarly a clarification is expected on the benefit of idc wherever the insurance company actually have the route of reimbursement to the taxpayer where the invoice of repair could be in the name of the insured itself so this would be the second clarification so as a whole i i firmly believe that insurance as a sector would be very happy with this uh, relief granted to them by the gst council late but never so it is uh, a good the relief given by the council uh, ashish will you be able to quickly take up uh, the other clarification so, so maybe that we'll take only for 5 minutes yeah one issue was on this uh, hostel pgs where in earlier threshold was 1000 rupees per month lesser than that was exempted but last year that exemption was withdrawn so the un cry was that students or the people seeking job coming to cities and when they are staying they have now they have to pay now gst so what the council is proposing that if your total rental is up to 20000 per month and you intend to stay for more than 90 days similar circular was there in the service tax regime also for 90 days then this benefit uh, of exemption can be claimed and that they are going to make it retrospective uh, since that last year whenever this amendment was made so if anybody has already paid subject to unjust enrichment refund can be claimed going forward need not charge tax provided that 20000 threshold is maintained with respect to goods exported and liable to export duty earlier refund was restricted under the lut provision no refund restriction was under the automated route now government is proposing to restrict the refund under the automated route also so that is the second amendment what they are proposing third clarification what they are intending to provide is on drc 03 so as of now if the taxpayer is paying any amount in the adjudication or maybe pre adjudication stage if he goes for filing of the appeal that amount paid through P, uh, drc 03 in the module uh, of the portal also does not get recognized as a valid payment for pre deposit so government is likely to come up with uh, some uh, uh, i would say uh, portal related operational changes plus clarification that any amount paid in the proceeding should be treated as pre deposit for drc 03 uh then another issue has been that this when initially 1 2 3 gstr 1 2 3 were proposed at that point of time if as a supplier if i am issuing any credit note i can claim the adjustment of the tax on that credit note provided my customer has reversed the input tax credit but in 1 2 2 3 it is not possible for the supplier to ascertain whether the Uh, customer has reversed the input tax credit rajasthan high court in case of actual has instructed the council to provide some mechanism for that it is uh, what the council clarifies that they will come up with some mechanism to uh, uh, validate by the supplier if a customer has reversed the input tax credit not sure how it would be done if technological intervention is made then there would be again like what neeraj ji mentioned about one a related challenges there could be multiple challenges on that count if they provide some offline type of confirmation mechanism like what circular 183 193 was provided for uh, two a related declaration from the customer or his C supplier or his ca if they provide something like that then it is going to increase the compliance burden so this is going to have a major ramification on the whole compliance related aspect then this rule 42 43 for insurance company again very specific to life insurance we can skip for the deliberation uh, as of now taxability of loans granted in some of the cases department has imposed demand on the activity of extending loan also so there it appears that council intend to clarify that this activity of extending loan 
which is covered in the exemption notification, it cannot be made liable to GST. Then refund of additional IGST paid on export of goods. So sometime what happens, my export price gets increased either in the exchange rate fluctuation or otherwise. So if my original export was on payment of tax, wherein my refund was given to me based on matching between R1 and shipping uh, that ICE get, that mechanism is not available for the what you call supplementary invoice or additional amount recovered by the exporter from the foreign party. So in that situation, the council is intending to provide some maybe manual refund filing application for that incremental part of the amount uh, uh, on which tax is liable to be paid by the exporter. TCS rate government has reduced from 1% to 0.5%. ENA excluded from levy of GST when used for manufacture of liquor for human consumption. So when Vikram started deliberation, he touched upon that there might be change needed in the constitution. And I was a little surprised why constitution. Now when I'm looking at ENA, yeah, it comes to my mind that uh, the um, uh, amendment what they are proposing in the GST Act, it could possibly need some amendment in the constitution also, because many of us may not be in that field. So technically we will not take it up now, but yeah, it could require some constitutional amendment. GSTR 9 exempted to taxpayer with less than 2 crore turnover. Section 122.1b amended to provide for penal provision only where TCS is liable to be deducted. So presently that section imposed penalty of all e-commerce operator. Now it says that out of all e-commerce operator, only those e-commerce operator where they are liable to pay TCS. If they fail to pay TCS, then only this penalty would be applicable. So it is a clarificatory amendment type of stuff, we can say. Import in SCZ by SCZ unit for authorized operation. Exemption has been given from compensation, says. In this biometric-based Aadhaar authentication, which as a pilot basis government had started in the state of Gujarat uh, to curb the instances of the taking registration by the fraudulent people, so that now they intend to extend the whole of the country. The experience in Gujarat has been little tough for the business where what we sometimes get to know that in GST, that in the initial phase, that taking registration was the most easiest thing, which we call as a bandarbant. But here, uh, now this taking registration is the most difficult stuff in GST. And with this Aadhaar based authentication, it is going to be further complicated. While it is overall good that uh, uh, bad fishes do not enter, this, but it unnecessarily creates the harassment for the genuine uh, people who intend to take registrations. These were some of the additional uh, clarification what had come up. Uh, so uh, our deliberation has been primarily on the basis of the information available and our interpretation of the available information on record. Uh, we would. Uh, we all need to wait for the final document from the council to exactly see uh, how uh, things would uh, uh, pan or so. So with this, we conclude our deliberation. Now we can take up any uh, question uh, by the participants. Yeah, pardon me for uh, the bad throat in between. So it is all because of the council. I have to thank the council to make us speak uh, non-stop for the last three days. Yeah, so Molly, are you there? Uh, yes. Okay. Is there so a in case can... is also there on the backstage, maybe you could take him to the main stage. Yeah, any questions are there? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, let me read them out for you. Right. Okay, the first question is How will re availment of ITC due to amendment in section 16.4 work if such balance is not disclosed in electronic credit reversal ledger? How to defend DRC notices which will be triggered due to excess availment? Okay, so uh, I think this question is coming from that part of deliberation 
where we mentioned that uh, the 16 for relaxation what government has given and if somebody has already reversed in the past and in case if government comes up with the refund restriction then one could possibly look at reavailing that input tax credit so like what Vikram suggested and what Madhukar sir always suggest is that anything on the input tax credit it is always like our vested right to claim the benefit so when the government is giving this benefit to everybody if I had reversed in the past let it be taken in 3b let it be under an intimation to department also that why we are taking this particular thing if there happens to be a 2a versus 3b uh, notice whatever that uh, drc 21b or whatever this particular stuff because we would have already communicated it under the intimation letter to department even if it is uh, even if that uh, litigation generate out of this auto reconciliation or otherwise it would be worthwhile to contest it you could commercially take a call not to utilize that credit if you want to avoid that incremental interest cost on that we believe we are of the view that either council in the due course of time would extend the benefit to such bona fide taxpayer also or the court could possibly extend the benefit in that direction or so. Taking a worst case scenario, even if court does not give that benefit, let us say our counsel does not give, still we have nothing to lose if we are not utilizing that credit uh, line uh, uh, created in our ECL. So that is how I would look at in the entire uh, 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 planning of this particular stuff. One additional point here is say your uh, reavailment is under IGST. The portal will not allow you to retain the credit it will mandate you to utilize the credit so what we have been advising is that to the extent of that igst balance you maintain cash ledger balance so that that is one option second option is even if you have sufficient balance between c and s which is uh, enough to uh, offset that igst utilization even that is a compliance which is already clarified by the uh, board Madhukar, so you are on mute if you are speaking something. You are not audible, sir. Moli, can you check out? Uh... Uh, sir, could you try now? Sir, we are not, uh, sir. Your system appears to be on mute, sir. Yeah, we can take Molly Meanwhile, next question. Once uh, sir join, let him also give his comment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. You are audible now. Yeah. Uh, quick point. Wherever you have this issue where the procedures stop you, there is a fundamental right available where you can reverse under protest. So you have to give a letter saying that I am reversing under protest because the system does not allow me to retain it and I reserve the right to go for a full refund. That is another option to whatever options were provided by Ashish and Vikram. Please go ahead. Next question you can take. Yeah. Is the relief of interest and penalty available on order of appeal uh, matter under section 73 or is it limited to SCN order? Vikram? It would cover even matters which are under appeal. So you just have to withdraw the appeal in case you decide to settle the demand. But um, important factor is it has to be under section 73 only. And the withdrawal has to be in entirety, not for some of the issues and not for others. In case of related entity, the value mentioned in the invoice be treated as OMV provided the recipient is eligible for full ITC. What is the term full ITC mean? Should this be seen from the transaction basis or uh, <coughs> would it not be eligible if some exempted supplies are there? So, uh, in fact, this uh, this terminology full ITC 
is not defined under the GST law. If you look at, let us say, there has been a similar provision in the Singapore uh, GST law. This Indian uh, full ITC has been taken from the Singapore GST Act. So there what it provides that uh, there is some de minimis limit of I think 5% or 10%. So if there is a denial to the extent of that percentage, still it is treated as the full input tax credit. But in Indian context, if we look at this full ITC, the way this entire provision have been enacted by the government, it has to be looked at qua that particular invoice in respect of which we are intending to claim the input tax credit or where the related party is intending to claim the invoice value as open market value benefit. So if it is back to back for the taxable supply, yes, I can take full credit and would be treated as uh, falling into that OMV. If it falls into my common bucket, common expense bucket under rule 42, where I am engaged both in taxable as well as the exempt supply, then for me to claim that benefit or for my vendor to claim that benefit that it is a uh, full ITC supply, that would be a difficult proposition to uphold. One more uh, uh, reference which we can draw is that circular 199 where they discussed on this uh, zero has to be a value. There the logic given was revenue neutrality because ultimately whatever is going to be charged will be available as a credit. So government does not stand to lose by having a variation in the pricing for that particular transaction. So, it, as Ashish mentioned, it has to be quasi the transaction and not the business as a whole. Okay. The next question is, how do you see the issue of retrospective tax unfolding for the gaming industry since the FM had declined to comment on the same? So, uh, when uh, FM itself has declined to comment mm -hmm. being the uh, highest uh, authority making on this particular thing it would be very difficult to give uh, comment anything on that stuff but yeah this is uh, very much clear that if government wants to kill the industry fully then they should not certainly amend the act but if really they want to thrive the industry and weeding out the people who are claiming some uh, uh, wrong benefit or so there should be appropriate mechanism inbuilt in the system because this present taxation, what they had come up in the last uh, from October onward for the future period and ongoing matter in the court for the past period, all these are somewhere illegal, constitutionally also invalid, wherein in uh, some of the representation we have put across before the government. Let us see how do they see. Let us hear from the Madhukar sir also because he also happened to give his view on uh, this uh, issue to the some of the gaming companies yes sir uh, i think you have covered it should see any taxation the government has some power to make some policy does not mean that it should make policies which are away from basics like there is a right to do business the taxes which the government collects has to be reasonable Kautalya in his Artha Shastra had said government should not collect more than one-sixth of what is earned by the people. But now this government uh, and I think earlier governments also have taken 50% or so. Government has to be reasonable. They cannot be stubborn, I would say. In such matters, rather than get... This industry can go outside. It's an online gaming industry. They can go out also. Then they have to restrict the money. Then if they restrict the money, then Hawala will start. So there is no end to this. In fact, in the past, when there were some, uh, uh, you know, intermediary taxation in GST, where the service intermediary was made liable, then many of the people shifted out of India to Hong Kong and uh, Dubai. So what happened? India lost the income tax. India lost that income. India lost the employment possibility in all these cases. And that's what will happen in online industry if uh, the uh, finance minister continues to be stubborn and look at, uh, while looking at income, they don't mind. But when they look at uh, this industry, they talk about many things. They can ban it. They should say in India, we should not have any gambling at all. Okay, fine. 
but they want the income from gambling no they want the income from liquor so they have to be reasonable is what i think and i think finally that is what will prevail because the court people will not leave it they'll continue to go to the court okay and lastly as per audit observations the department raised